get into the lecture proper. We've got your exams are still out. I've got just a couple of people in my earlier class that haven't taken the exam yet, so I can't give you your exams back today. But I'm giving them back Wednesday, and anybody that hasn't taken their exam by then is just out of luck. Uh, they, they're supposed to have a week to, to get it done, which brings us to this Monday, uh, today. And if they haven't gotten it done by, uh, by Wednesday, then they're just out of luck. Uh, so you get your exams back on Wednesday, and I will also create a Google Classroom assignment. Uh, there will be an assignment for the first exam. You won't have to turn anything in for that. It'll just be so that I can record your, your grade, and, and you can see it through Google Classroom. So I should get that up, uh, get your grade up before you come to class on uh, Wednesday. So you can see that and then you'll, you'll get the physical copy of your test back to see what you missed and all that kind of stuff on Wednesday. Uh, reminder about the extra credit assignment. It's to do the, the review uh, the, or the study guide, handwrite your answers to it uh, and turn it back in and you'll get half the points that you lost. And if you want to have your grade, if you want to have that, those extra credit points reflected in the six-week grade that gets put into KMs, uh, or to be considered for whether you end up on an at-risk report or not, then that has to be done this week. I need it by, uh, by Friday uh, so that I can get your grade submitted by Monday, because that's the, the latest that I can turn them in. I'll put them all in by the end of business on Monday. Uh, so if you want, you want your... Uh, extra credit points to be reflected in your six weeks grade and your uh, at-risk report, whether you make it into the at-risk report or not, uh, that will be due on Friday. Otherwise, you have, if you don't care, then you have until the second exam. Um, also, uh, just kind of a, a warning, I, I realized this morning, actually, it, it like hit me this morning, I had not given you guys any reading assignments for last week. I just totally forgot to post reading assignments for last week. and. And for this week. And so I posted reading assignments for this week, this morning. Uh, I did not expect anybody to have actually done the reading before you get here for this class, even though I gave you the selections uh, for today. And I didn't actually expect you to do that with three hours notice. Uh, but they, they're posted for Wednesday and Friday. And I want to give you fair warning that uh, from this point on in the semester, readings are probably going to get a little longer. Uh, we, we took four weeks to cover Genesis, which had 52 chapters, uh, or 50 chapters. One of those, I'm forgetting now. Uh, but around 50 chapters for Genesis in four weeks, and so you averaged a relatively short section a day, you know, just a few chapters. And the first day, I think, was two chapters. The, the second day was another two chapters, and, and it got a little longer from there. But you, you never really had more than six or eight chapters to read for a day. From this point on, we're going to be dealing with much bigger hunks of text in each class period. And so, for example, today we're gonna to deal with the entire book of Leviticus. And then on Wednesday, we'll deal with the entire book of Numbers. And then Friday, we're gonna deal with the entire book of Deuteronomy. Those are fairly significant sized books, and we're gonna do the whole thing in one day. And so that's, that's longer chunks of reading. Fortunately for you, I'm not requiring you to read the whole book every day. You're not gonna to have to read the entire book. I have selected portions of the books uh, for you to read all this week. And if you look at them on Google Classroom, you'll find that it's actually probably only about 10 to 15 percent of each book that I'm having you read. Uh, I've kind of hit the highlights through, uh, and the the referencing for doing that when I when I go in to make the verse references for that and put them up there, it, it gets kind of long and convoluted. You can figure them out just by going and looking at the reading assignment, and it, it tells you what portions to read. It gives you chapter and verse numbers and the range that you're supposed to read for everything. But it's also I understand a little bit complicated or time consuming and some maybe confusing to try to read all the appropriate sections and look them all up yourself. And so for Wednesday and Friday of this week, I've also included a link that will take you to a Bible gateway page that has just all the readings on one page. And that's, that's all the scripture that's on that page is the, the readings you're supposed to do for that day. And so if you read all the scripture that's on that page, you will have read the day's reading. Uh, so it's, you know, try to simplify your life at least a little when it comes to those more complicated verse references. Uh, anyway, so make sure that you, you get those readings done for Wednesday and Friday. Uh, there, there may be a quiz in class to uh, keep you honest for that. Uh, we tried to, everybody writing a question that went okay. We're gonna try some top quizzes now. Um, so the, uh, any, any questions about exam, extra credit or the reading assignments? Oh, no, no, no.
the four questions are already supposed to be done, but I'll still take them if you turn them in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they, get those in ASAP. They, they were already supposed to be done. Any others? All right, well then let's get into the, the lecture then, the, the actual text part. Um, on Friday, yeah, today's Monday, that's right, it's Friday. Um, it's all run together. <laughs> um, on Friday, we left off just before the end of Exodus. We talked about the construction and the, the layout of the tabernacle. Uh, and, you know, that, that structure and layout of the tabernacle is, is important, you know, the, the kind of nesting uh, rectangle shape of you get the outer courtyard with the altar and the sea and then you have the tabernacle proper the tent inside the, the tabernacle structure uh, where only the priest can go and then you have the that that region is called the holy place and then you have the most holy place behind that curtain that has the ark of the covenant where god's presence is supposed to dwell um, and very powerfully does dwell in exodus and Le uh, leviticus and numbers but over time you'll see that it it's less and less powerfully present uh, because the people of Israel are, are more and more distant from God and are not reflecting God's character very well. Uh, but God's presence is, is in that most holy place. Uh, and the whole point of the tabernacle, in fact, the, a name for a portion of the tabernacle, that tent structure inside it, is the tent of meeting. Uh, the whole point is to be the place where God's presence and, and the camp or, or the nation of Israel can come together, where the people of Israel can enter into God's presence and worship God. That's, that's the whole purpose of the tent, the whole purpose of the tabernacle, its whole function is to make it possible for the people of Israel can, to enter into God's presence and to have this relationship with God. And so the it makes it kind of odd then, or, or challenging, problematic, that the very last thing that we see in Exodus is the tabernacle being constructed, it's finished, it's all done, and God's presence enters into the tabernacle and rests over the most holy place, over the Ark of the Covenant, and God's presence is powerfully there, and nobody can go in. Moses himself is stuck outside of the tabernacle. He can't enter. And God speaks to Moses from the tent. So God has to speak out to Moses and speak to Moses, but Moses can't go in and be in God's presence. And so Moses is kind of representative of the entire nation at this point. The tabernacle is built, and so Moses is kind of... The whole nation is, is he's representing the whole nation to God. And nobody, not even Moses, can go in and enter to God's presence. Because even though the tabernacle is there, and it's all been built, and this is its purpose, there's still something missing. So they have the place, but they don't have the what. They don't have what they're supposed to do. And so that's the end of Exodus. Exodus ends with Moses unable to enter into the tabernacle, and God speaking to Moses from out of the tent of meeting, out from the tabernacle speaking out to Moses. And that's kind of a, an unfortunate position. They've, they've done this, they, they, they broke the covenant, but God gave them a second chance. But they built this tabernacle specifically for the purpose of entering God's presence, and at the end of the book, they can't enter God's presence. But if you read ahead and you look at the very beginning of the book of Numbers, the very beginning of the book of Numbers says that God speaks to Moses in the tent of meeting, and so Moses has been able to enter and so something happens in Leviticus, or Leviticus happens and changes the situation. From Moses being unable to enter into the tent, and none of the people being able to enter into God's presence, to God speaks to Moses within the tent. And so that's, something changes in Leviticus. That Leviticus does something that changes their situation. And now they're able to enter into God's presence as they are intended to. And so Leviticus, that's, that's the purpose of Leviticus. Leviticus is doing something that allows the people to enter into God's presence. It's telling them what relationship with God has to look like, what laws they have to obey, what holiness is supposed to look like, and, and what it takes to be able to enter into God's presence and to enjoy a relationship with God. And so the contents of Leviticus, though, what, what we find in Leviticus is some of it is you know, fairly straightforward and obvious to us, but some of it is really strange to us. Uh, there's things like, you know, don't commit murder. That was pretty obvious to it. We get, we get that. There's a, a kind of a, a version of the Ten Commandments repeated in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19. By the way, for the exam, if you are looking for the copy of the Ten Commandments that you're supposed to learn in order to know the Ten Commandments for the exam, that's in Exodus chapter 20. Look at Exodus chapter 20. 
But there's also a version of the Ten Commandments, or an amended version of the Ten Commandments in Leviticus 19, and then again, there's another version in Deuteronomy as well. So they change? They're not, they're not changed, they're just not ordered the same way. God gives the same commands, but they're in a different order, and there's extra stuff mixed in and, and blended in with it. And so to, to eliminate confusion, I'm saying go to the Exodus Ten Commandments, because that's the ones pretty much everybody recognizes. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, you'll, you'll need to be able to, to do the Ten Commandments, and I usually give bonus points for doing them all and having them in order. So, yeah. You, you will need to know the Ten Commandments for the, the second exam and probably get bonus points for doing them in order. Uh, but there's, you know, you got the, the Ten Commandments is in Exodus 20, but then there's another version slightly reworded and with extra stuff added in in Exodus or in Leviticus 19. And those are pretty straightforward, clear. We get that. But then and also in Leviticus 19, there's a command that you should not make clothing out of cloth made with mixed fibers. And so no mixing wool and cotton or linen in your clothing. And none of us are obeying that right now. I, I just about guarantee that none of us have pure cotton or pure wool clothing on right now. Uh, if this was a, a vital, vital requirement, we'd all be in trouble. Uh, so some of the stuff makes, makes obvious sense to us, and it, or at least we can understand why the command would be given, and some stuff is totally opaque to us. It's just, we, don't, we don't get it. Uh, and so that's, that's, you know, the mixed fiber thing is one example. Another example might be the limitations on what food the, the people were allowed to eat, and uh, what, what foods were considered clean and unclean. And so, like, you can, you can eat lamb, you can eat goat, you can't eat pig. So your bacon and your sausage is gone. You, you, no pork. Uh, and no shellfish. So if you like shrimp, you're out of luck. Yeah. So I mean, if they, if, they, if you're if that's your your thing, you like eating those things, that's your you're out. <laughs> no shrimp, no lobster, no no crab, nothing nothing that is a shellfish. <laughs> and so you know those those things are all out, and those that doesn't make a lot of sense to us. And then there's also other things that are like totally unavoidable that make you unclean, like ladies. Being on your period. Uh, being on your period makes you unclean, and there's something you have to do for that. And if you give birth, then there's something you have to do for that as well. That makes you unclean, you have to do something after that. Uh, touching a dead body makes you unclean, you have to do something for that. And so the, there's all, all these other regulations that are less obvious to us, and some of them can get to be downright confusing. And so to understand what's going on in Leviticus, and uh, to at least give us a framework for understanding what's happening, uh, there's some concepts that we got to get straight before we get into the text and some of the stuff that's in it. First is the idea of holiness, uh, or just the word holy. If I were to ask you what the word holy means, you would probably give me the wrong answer, so I'm not going to ask you. I'm, I'm just going to tell you, most people, if you've grown up in church or if you, you've been around it or you just kind of tangentially have heard about holiness, most people's idea of what it means to be holy is to be good to be morally perfect, to, to do what's right always, to follow all the rules, to, to do what you're supposed to do, or what God commands you, and that's what makes you holy. That's not actually it. Uh, now, being morally perfect is an element within holiness, but that is not what holiness is. And if you don't understand what holiness is, then Leviticus is going to confuse you because it's going to describe lots of things as holy, for example, and you can't really have a morally perfect butter knife, right? Uh, it's like you can't, you can't really have a morally perfect knife or a morally perfect pitcher for water. Those things can't be holy if, if holy means morally perfect. So moral perfection comes into holiness, but it isn't holiness. Yes. We'll, we'll get there. Yes, first fruits is the word that's written down here, but we'll get there a little later. So holiness is, uh, first thing, God is holy. God is holy. Uh, and... God is utterly unique. God is unlike anything else that exists. In fact, God exists and everything else only exists because God made it. And so God's existence is different than everything else's existence. God created everything else. God, God is, God has being, and then everything else only has being because God made it. Right? And so God is different. God is special. God is unique. So God is different and set apart from everything else. And then everything else, any, anybody that wants to be holy or anything that, that is holy, is only holy if it is set apart for God, if it is dedicated to God. And so that's the basic understanding, the basic idea behind holiness, is that it is set apart to God. 
God is holy because God is utterly unique. And we are holy if we are set apart to him. If we are dedicated and set apart for him. And so if you go like the tabernacle, the tabernacle itself, the whole thing is holy because it is set apart for God's purposes. It, it's set apart for the worship of God, and there's nothing else that can happen in there. There's nothing else that's supposed to go on inside the tabernacle except for all of these various things that are part of worshiping God and being God's people. And so the tabernacle itself is holy because it's set apart for God. And then when you go inside the tabernacle, you'll find all of these things that are also holy because they're set apart for particular purposes for worshiping God. So like the altar is holy. Uh, the, the candelabra in the, in the holy place is holy because it's set apart for God's use. And not only these kind of big furniture, big structural things, but also a lot of the implements in the temple that are used, like the aforementioned knives and uh, other utensils and pitchers and cups and bowls, all the things that are used in the ritual part of the life inside the tabernacle are holy. So for example, if you are on the way to the well to draw some water, you're, you're an Israelite and you're on the way to, well, to the well to draw some water and you drop your, you drop your clay jar and it shatters, you can't just duck into the tabernacle and borrow a holy pitcher and come out and scoop up some water with it, take it to your house, and then bring the pitcher back. You can't just run in and borrow something in the tabernacle that's set apart as holy for common use because it is set apart for God. And it can only be used in the ways that God specifies, that God, God tells them to use it. It can only be used for those purposes. And so something is holy if it is set apart to God. A person, then, is holy if they are set apart to God. And so the whole nation of Israel is God's chosen people, and so they are supposed to be a holy people. They are set apart for God. But in order to actually be holy as a person, for a human being to actually be holy, then they have to not just be in title or in name dedicated to God or set apart to God, but they have to, have to actually behave in a way that reflects God's character. They have to actually do things that are like God, and that's where the moral perfection thing comes in. You have to actually do what God says and live in a way that's consistent with what God wants in order to be reflecting who God is, to be showing God's character, and that's what's required for being holy. And so to be holy means to be set apart to God, or to be God, which none of us can do. So to be holy means to be set apart to God, and for human beings, that means to reflect God's character in what we do. Now, that reflecting God's character, there's a couple of different ways that we could potentially not be living in a way that reflects God's character. One of them is that we could choose to do things that are against God's commands or against what God wants, against what God is, who God is, that there are anti or contrary to God's nature, God's character. And so, for example, something like murder would be contrary, a choice that you make. It's something that you do that is contrary to God's character because God brings life and you have just brought death. It is contrary to God's character. It's a, gets what God commands, gets what God wants humanity to do. It's contrary to God's character. It makes you unholy. And when you do something that is, is like that, is morally wrong, is, is directly, it's contrary to God's nature, God's character, that is something that is sinful. It is, it is sin to, to do something that is like that that is so contrary to God's nature, that is anti-God's God's character, and it will make you, you will be unholy. But then there's other things that in themselves are not necessarily contrary to God's character, but they symbolically reflect something that is against God's character. And so, for example, the touching of a dead body. Now, if you murdered somebody, then you have done something that is against God's character, right? You've done something that's against life and, and God brings life that's contrary to God's character. That's, that's sin. But if you touch a dead body, then you have come in contact with death. And symbolically, something has happened there that makes you unclean or impure. It's not that you have done something that is morally wrong. In fact, if you have a family member die, especially in a culture where you don't have professional undertakers, you're going to have to handle that dead body in order to prepare it for burial. You're going to have to touch dead things as just part of life. But once you touch something dead, you have symbolically touched something and taken something onto you, or you have symbolically come in contact with something that is representative of something that is anti-God's character, that is unholy. And so 
you are unclean and you can't just go waltzing into God's presence as though nothing had happened, carrying those marks of something that's against God's character. And so that makes you unclean or impure. It's not necessarily sinful. It's not that you've done something morally wrong, but it would be morally wrong then to go waltzing into God's presence with all those marks of something anti-God on you. And so that's, there are all kinds of things in Leviticus that are described as unclean or that they will make you unclean or that they are impure. But those are not things that, not necessarily things that you have done that are sinful and that you are guilty for. But then if you choose to go and act like nothing happened and waltz into God's presence and, and pretend that you aren't carrying those marks of something that's anti-God, that would be immoral. Now you've done something to, to be guilty about. Uh, now you've done something sinful. And if you are made unclean, it, it's worth noting here that uncleanness is not a permanent state. If you, if you touch a dead body, you are unclean until nightfall, for example, or until the following nightfall, depending. And so there's, it, it's a short-term thing. You, you touch a dead body, you're unclean for a day. Uh, and there's other things that can make you unclean for longer, that you have to wait longer. And then there's a ritual that you have to do to be ritually cleansed so that you are back in the state of clean and can enter into God's presence. But, but you, it, it's not a permanent state, and it doesn't reflect moral wrongdoing. It's, it's uncleanness, and you, you are symbolically unclean. You have done something or touched something that's symbolically contrary to God's character, and you can't just enter into the tabernacle and go about your normal life. You've got you to do something special around that, but it's not morally wrong. That's going to help you figure out, and holding that distinction is going to help you when you look at laws that say, for example, that a woman is unclean during her period. That doesn't mean that the woman has done something morally wrong in, in having a period. You, you can't not, right? Just, I mean, now you probably could for a period, of, you know, for a length of time at least. You either take birth control pills without the, the off week for a long period of time, and you could, you could skip several. But if, especially back then, there's, there's no way you're going to avoid it. It's going to happen. It's not morally wrong, but there is something about it that carries the signs of death. The, the constant bleeding, for example. Uh, it carries the signs of death, and you can't just go walking into God's presence, the giver of life, while reflecting death. And so you have to wait until it's over and then be ritually cleansed, and then you go. So that's, that's a very important concept. First, holiness, that holiness is something set apart to God, and then the difference between uncleanness or impurity and sinfulness. Uh, sinfulness has the moral element that it's, it's morally wrong, and you, you have to... You have made a choice. You've done something that you ought not have done. Uh, and cleanness or impurity is usually just coming in contact with something that is symbolically not like God or not, not in God's character. And so you have to be cleansed from that before you can then go into God's presence and reflect God's character and holiness. All right. Any, any questions so far? Because that's it's kind of an unfamiliar way of thinking. All right, one last uh, background thought or background idea kind of thing before we get into the, the actual content. Uh, there are uh, Christians have, for since there have been Christians, uh, struggled with or tried to figure out how exactly Christians are supposed to handle and use the laws of the Old Testament because they are Scripture. Christians consider them to be the Word of God, they are Scripture. But we're also told that we don't have to obey all of them because Christ has fulfilled the law. And so we don't have to obey all of the Old Testament law because Christ has fulfilled the law. And so which parts of the Old Testament are now fulfilled and okay for us to leave alone, and which ones are we still obligated to follow? For, you know, keep going back to the murder thing. Jesus fulfilling the law doesn't mean that it's now perfectly okay for us to murder somebody, right? That law did not change when, because Jesus died and rose from the dead. But the whole, you know, can't eat pork, obviously we, we don't follow that one, or at least most of us don't follow that one. I don't, I don't follow that one. I mean, today I'm pretty good so far, but that's because I haven't eaten yet, and not because I have you know, I don't eat pork. Uh, it's, it's, there's some things that we follow and some things that we don't, and so what is the distinction? What, what, is the kind of, what is the framework that helps us decide which things we're supposed to continue following and which things we are not? That's this. There are three different kinds of laws, or three laws that deal with different kinds of things in Leviticus and elsewhere in the, uh, the Torah, the, the first five books. Uh, there, are, there are different kinds of laws that deal with different kinds of situations and things. Uh, the first kind is, is ritual or ceremonial laws. 
these are the laws that have to do with the specific ritual practices and religious practices of Israel. And so that's things like the listing of sacrifices over here that we're going to be talking about in a minute, or the, the specific feasts that Israel uh, observes uh, in and around the tabernacle, the, those things, or the, the dealing with priesthood and who, who qualifies as a priest and, and how they're supposed to be ordained and set apart for priesthood, those kinds of things, those are all ritual or ceremonial laws. They have to do with the rituals, the, the actual ritual and religious life of Israel. Uh, and so that's, that's the first kind of law. The second kind is civil law, and that has to do with stuff that would normally be governed by, let's say, you know, our government, the kind of laws that our federal government would make uh, to deal with how we relate to each other, how property is to be handled, the, the relationships between, say, husbands and wives, parents and children, those kinds of things. The, the kind of legal code or the, the civil, as a civil society or as a nation, what kind of laws Israel is supposed to have. And that would be stuff like how long you can own a piece of land before it reverts back to its original owner in Israel. And that's a, that's some law peculiar to Israel because the understanding is that God owns all the land and is giving it to the people. It's there, it's being given to them as a gift, and it's, it's being specified as, as who it belongs to from the get-go, so who's supposed to be using it, which tribes and which families are allowed to take this land and use it is specified from, from the get-go. And a lot, actually, when we get into Joshua, uh, the, the next major section, uh, a lot of the space in Joshua is dedicated to the delineation of who owns what parts of the land, which tribes settle where, and which clans within those lands settle where, and all that kind of stuff. And so the, it's all specified who lives where, and who has what, what land belongs to who. And you can only buy land from somebody to use until a particular day, until the, the year of Jubilee. And that's all specific law stuff that has to do with Israel as a nation. I mean, nobody, nobody else is obeying that, right? That, that's not a pattern that we have anywhere else in the world, in fact. Uh, and so those, those are all things that are, are civil law. They have to do with like, real estate and, and transactions and the, the kind of things that the government would make laws about. Uh, and then finally, there is the moral law. And these are the things that are recognized as being a moral issue uh, no matter you know, what time you're in. And so things about like you know murdering people, we keep going back to that one, or, or honesty and stealing and, and defrauding or cheating people, uh, sexual ethics, things you know who you should sleep with and who you should not sleep with and when and, and under what circumstances and all that stuff. Uh, all of, all of those things fall under moral law, and that's you know those things. The moral law is applicable to all people at all times. It's not specifically about Israel, it's not specifically about them as a nation, or about them as a, uh, a government or a people, or, or them and their religious practices. It's, it's common to all. And so something like don't kill is acknowledged by practically everybody everywhere. That's a moral law. Right? And so the, the, these are the three distinctions, three different kinds of law. The first two are not binding on believers anymore. Uh, Jesus has fulfilled this law, and we don't have to follow them anymore. And so we don't have to celebrate the year of Jubilee, or all of the, the festivals and feasts, or make these sacrifices, uh, or you know, always keep our, our hair uh, trimmed and, and kept in a certain way, or not wear clothing that has mixed fibers in it. All those kinds of things fall under these first two categories, and we aren't obligated to obey them anymore. But knowing them helps us to understand who God is, why God would command those things for Israel, and they also, uh, knowing them helps to understand, helps you understand what's going on in the rest of the Old Testament and also into the New Testament. And so they're important to know, but they aren't obligatory. We don't follow them anymore. And then there's the moral law that we do follow. We are required to obey. So there's your, your three different kinds of law and why Christians obey some of the laws in Leviticus and not all. Um, Let's get into the, the actual stuff in the book. Uh, and to do this, I have to introduce you to another idea, <laughs> uh, the idea of chiasmus. This is a literary device or literary structure thing. Uh, it's a way of kind of shaping a, uh, a story or a text uh, that gives it a, a rhetorical effect. So most of you probably, you know, you're familiar with rhyming, right? You know, you know what rhyming looks like and, or what it sounds like. It's where you repeat the same sound. And alliteration is just kind of the same, same thing, but in reverse. Instead of being the end of the word making the same sound, it's the beginning of the word making the same sound. 
Uh, or you, you may be familiar with parallelism where you say something and then you say something very similar to it that means the same thing as a way of reinforcing the idea. Well, chiasmus is the same kind of thing. It is a literary structure that gives a particular kind of effect and, and adds a rhetorical force to what you're saying. And so an example of that, the basic structure of a chiasmus is that you have a, a kind of a mirror image symmetry. And so you'll have a, an order of things at the beginning that is then reversed at the end. And one really simple version or example of a chiasmus, if you, any of you have ever heard the John F. Kennedy's uh, speech, the, the saying, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So it's, this, it's in the beginning, there's an idea, and then that idea is, is reversed at the end. And it has a rhetorical effect, right? You, you see the contrast between the two very clearly. Uh, another way that chiasmus can be used is you can have a whole lot more than just two elements that you're reversing there. You can have, have potentially super long lists. Uh, and when you have the, the mirror image, one of the things that it can do is, is draw your attention to the center. And that's how it's very often used in Hebrew literature, Hebrew poetry. Uh, and we have in, in Leviticus, we have a chiastic structure that you don't necessarily see because it's actually not a particular portion of the book. It's not just a few phrases. It's the whole book. The whole book has the chiastic structure. And so there is a, there's a kind of a, a pattern that's established in the first half, and then in the second half that pattern is reversed. But it covers these big subjects and these whole, the whole big structure of the book. And the purpose, once again, as it usually is in Hebrew poetry or, or literature, is to draw focus towards the center thing, the thing that's at the, the peak of the pyramid or that, that's at the end of the series uh, that, before it gets reversed. And so we have these seven major sections to the book of Leviticus. Uh, we have chapters 1 through 7, and then 8 through 10, 11 through 15, chapter 16, then 17 through 20, 21 and 22, and then 23 through 25. Those are the seven major sections. And the, the way it, it chias, chiasmus or chiastic structure works is kind of like Russian nesting dolls, where you, you kind of have a, you, you have two things that are matched, and then you open those up, and then there's another two things that are matched at the beginning and the end, and then you open those up, and there's another two things that are matched, and so on. And so we have this first major section that deals is dealing with sacrifices, and then there is a kind of a mirrored theme in the last major section that has to do with feasts. And so these, these two things are related because they both have to do with the major ritual or cultic practices in the tabernacle, the things that they do. So these, these feasts are things that happen occasionally, from the Sabbath that happens once a week and then to the rest of them that happen once a year. And on the other end, you have the sacrifices that are done daily, but they all have to do with worshiping God, with dealing with, with their relationship with God, uh, things that God has done for them that they must remember, and, and kind of day in, day out deal stuff in relating with God. And so these two sections are parallel to each other, even though they're at the very beginning and the very end. And then if you look at the next two sections, the, the second section and then the next to last section, you have two sections that deal with the priests, that are specifically about the priesthood. And so on one side, you'll have dealing with the beginning of the priestly ministry and how they're ordained and what they have to do in order to become priests. And then at the end, this, the second one, you'll have a section dealing with the qualifications to be a priest. What does it take to be a priest? Or what does is, what is the priestly role look like? How do they perform it? And then the third major section gets paired with the third to last moral section, and they both have to do with purity, but on, on the beginning, the first one, it's, it's the ritual purity, the, the things that can make somebody unclean, what foods they can eat and not eat. And then the, the last one, the second one, is moral purity. That's where that whole Ten Commandments section and chapters dealing with uh, cheating people and, and behaving morally as a, as a society and sexual ethics and all that, that comes in this section on moral purity. And then finally, the center section, it, since there's an odd number of sections, there is no parallel or mirror for this one. It's, it comes to a point. And that, that is the manual of atonement that deals with the day of atonement. And so that, this ends up being the focus for the book. The, the structure focuses you to this. So now the contents, the stuff that we're actually looking at, or that's actually there. Uh, in, in the first major section, we have the Manual of Sacrifices, and it lays out the, the major varieties of sacrifices that are carried out in the tabernacle and then later the temple day in and day out. Uh, the first is the sacrifice, uh, the burnt offering. 
sacrifice burnt offering. And it is just part of the daily function of the tabernacle. This isn't an individual bringing in a sacrifice to be offered. It's, it's something that is done by the priests as just a normal function of the tabernacle. And so every day they will come in and they'll, they'll build up the fire from the previous day and get the, get the sacrificial fire on the altar going again. And they'll bring in an animal for this burnt offering. And the very first thing, first offering of the day is this burnt offering. And the animal is slaughtered, its blood is used, and the whole thing is placed on the altar to, to burn all, all day long. And so the whole, the, this is the whole animal, no part of it reserved, nothing, nothing's left out. It's cut into pieces. The whole thing is burned, and it burns all day, all night, right, until the next day. Then there are two, two offerings. And again, this is, this is every day. Every day starts with this. It's the first sacrifice of the day every day. Then there are two different kind of uh, gratitude offerings or just, just ways of uh, fulfilling promises to God or expressing gratitude to God for whatever God has blessed you with, whatever God has done for you. So you have the grain offering and the fellowship offering. The grain offering is an offering of grain. Shocker. Fellowship offering is similar, but it's of an animal. Instead of similar purpose, but it's an offering of an animal. And so if you're offering a grain offering or a fellowship offering, you come in with what you want to offer. The, and their specifications. It gives instructions for what is to be offered and, and how it's to be done. But you come in and you present your offering to the priest, and the priest will take a portion of it and put it on the altar to burn. And that, that's the portion that goes is, is God's portion. You're, you're giving that portion to God, and it's being consumed in the fire. And then the rest of it is divided. There's, there's a portion of it that goes to the priests, and then a portion of it that goes back with you to celebrate with. And this, uh, except for the burnt offering, the rest of the offerings have some portion that goes to the priests because the, this is how the priests survive. If you're going to be day in, day out in, in the tabernacle making sacrifices for other people, you can't plant and harvest and you can't you know, make things to sell. And so you've got to survive somehow. So God specifies that a portion of these offerings are to be given to the priests and that's how they live. That's what they survive off of. And so a portion of it, a portion of the grain, if you bring in grain offering, that's either, either whole grain or flour or bread made from the flour. And so a portion of that goes on the altar, a portion of it goes to the priests. Uh, and then if you, you're making a fellowship offering, the, the, the animal is slaughtered and a portion, particular parts of it are placed on the altar to burn. And then a portion of what's left goes to the priest, and then a portion of it goes with you, uh, with the, the worshiper, to take home and to celebrate with. And there's actually a command in, in this. That part of the specification is that it must be consumed that day. You have to eat it all that day. And the purpose for that, I think, is to keep people from saving parts of it or hoarding parts of it and to use it all, actually, all at once and celebrate. Because if you're going to eat, I mean, you got a whole animal to eat, you're going to invite people over, you're going to get it all eaten, right? <laughs> there's only so much that you and your family immediately are going to eat. And so you take it home, and if you have to consume it all in one day, you're going to make a party of it, and you're going to celebrate. And so there's a requirement that you take it off, that it has to all be consumed that day. And so but these, are, these are ways of saying thank you or for paying for vows. If you make a promise to God, if you say, like, God, give my, my wife good health or let my, my child be born healthy, let my crops come in, let this animal do well, whatever, whatever you say, oh God, if you will do this, I, will, I vow that I will make a sacrifice. It's something that they, they did in the, the Old Testament. Uh, if you, you make that promise, then this is how you fulfill it. This is, this is the offering you give to fulfill that promise. And then there's also uh, offerings. If these are to say thank you, these are to say I'm sorry. The sin offering and the guilt offering are ways of, of dealing with failure, uh, dealing with moral failure. So if, if somebody you know, commits a sin, they, they sleep with somebody they're not supposed to, they kill a neighbor, they cheat somebody out of, of something, or they steal something from somebody, they have committed a sin, and so they're going to offer a sin offering. And for that, there's a particular kind of animal that has to be brought in, and it's different for different people in the community. If you're a leader, you have to bring in a more valuable animal. If you're a priest, you have to bring in a more valuable animal. If you're just average Joe, you bring in a less valuable animal, but still it, all of them have to be a, a perfect animal, a, a spotless animal. Uh, and you bring them in and you make your offering. And the offering is, is it's part of it is put on the altar and burnt up, and you are forgiven. Uh, if you, you come and you confess your sin, and you, you make this offering that the animal suffers in your place or takes your place in, uh, in 
dealing with your sin, God's justice is met in the animal, and you are, are forgiven. And this is how you're able to live in community with a just and perfect God, even though you are an imperfect person that is sinned. Uh, and then, if you then uh, if you are not, you know, if you're poor, there there are some people that this might lock them out of making offerings to God forever if they had to to present a valuable animal every time that they messed up. And so there are poverty offerings. There's a, a version of the offering if you can't afford the the female goat that is is the standard requirement. If you can't afford that, then you can offer two pigeons or, or two doves, two birds. And that's your, your offering. And if even that is too expensive, you can offer a certain quantity of flour, of, of ground, finely ground flour, which would be much cheaper than any of the animals. And so the, basically this, this offering or this sacrifice is set up so that even the poorest of the poor can still participate and aren't locked out of going into God's presence because they don't have money. So there, there's you know, multiple, multiple levels to that sin offering. And then there's the guilt offering, and that, that usually has to do specifically with cheating somebody out of something or cheating, uh, withholding something from God that you were obligated to give. And there's something, there's, there's parts built into this guilt offering that you have to give more or give something that's of greater value than what you lost. And there's a particular scale that you're supposed to give, but basically it's, it's dealing with being dishonest and making sure that people get paid back if you've been dishonest with them and uh, also dealing with the, the sin element. And so guilt usually has to do with cheating somebody or, or cheating God. Uh, but these are, these are the basic set of sacrifices. You have the burnt offering that's done every day uh, as, as the start of the day. It's just part of the sacrifice is offered every day. And then you have the thank you offerings and the I'm sorry offerings. And then on the other end over here, we have the feasts. You have the, the, the several feasts that are celebrated every year. You have, first is the, the Sabbath day, that's every week. And in the beginning, it's just don't work that day. You just have to rest that day. And then over time, traditions get added to it and built into it. And there's a particular meal and several different kind of ritual things that happen during that meal. Uh, but basically, the idea is one day you just don't work. You rest and you live in God's presence. And then there is the Passover that we saw last time, last week. Uh, the Passover had to do with that tenth plague on Egypt when, when God caused the death of the firstborn in all of Egypt. But he told the people to paint the blood of a lamb on their doorpost or a ram on their doorpost. And death would pass over that household and then gave specifications for how they were to eat the meal and eat that meat from that animal. Uh, that is the Passover. And the Passover happens on a particular evening. It's the, the, the very beginning of the 15th day. Uh, or the, the evening of the 14th day, depending on how you, you try to scale it. But uh, there's the Passover celebration, Passover meal, and then there's the Festival of Unleavened Bread that goes for a week after that. And a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people just kind of combine these two in, in their heads, and they'll, they'll say Passover and Festival of Unleavened Bread as though they're the same thing and interchangeable. Technically, the Passover is that painting the blood on the doorpost and that meal that you eat immediately after that. And then the Unleavened Bread is the week-long festival after that that celebrates being brought out of Egypt in haste. They were, they were brought out of Egypt because they carried out the, the bread dough. They, they carried out the troughs of dough from Egypt, and they made unleavened bread from that for as long as it lasted. And so for a week, they eat unleavened bread in Israel as part of that celebration. And then there is the Festival of the First Fruits. Uh, this is a harvest festival. When, you're, when your first grain crop of the year comes in, there's typically two grain crops in the year in Israel. You'd have, have early grains and late grains, and different grains grew better at different times. And so you'd have the first grains and then the late grains. And so the festival of first fruits was the harvest time for that first uh, harvest, the first grain harvest. And the, the purpose or the, the point is that you come and you bring some of the first that comes off the land, the first of, you, first of what you harvest from the land, and you offer it to God in celebration and in thanks. And you offer the first because if you're offering the first, then you aren't giving, waiting to see what all comes in. It's an act of trust. You're trusting God to give you enough even if you make this offering. And so you're trusting God to give you enough off of the land with what's still on your land after you come and bring the first of what you've taken. And then there is the Festival of Weeks, which is also called Pentecost. Uh, this was a second harvest festival that came after the second grain harvest. And once again, you came and you presented an offering. And this is kind of known in the New Testament because it was during the festival of Pentecost that the, the church really blew up. It's in, in Acts chapter 2, the, the church started expanding and growing uh, after Jesus ascended into heaven. 
And then you have the, parrot, the, the Feast of Trumpets, and this is basically just an extra day off that they, you play lots of trumpets, and it, it's at the midpoint of the year. It's the first day of the seventh month, and so it's kind of like the, the mid-year celebration. Uh, and then you have a festival of booths, uh, or a festival of tabernacles, where people build these uh, temporary shelters and live in these tents for a week to remind themselves of what it was like to wander in the wilderness when, before God led them to their, their promised land. So to remember what their ancestors went through in living in these booths or these tents in the desert. Now, I don't, I don't have time to, to go into the ritual and moral purity sections, uh, but we, we do need to, we really need to hit the Day of Atonement stuff in the center section. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. I, I hate that I don't have time to get into it, but uh, the Day of Atonement, the central feature, uh, this, the Day of Atonement is the last of the feasts. Uh, it's also called Yom Kippur. That's the, the phrase, Hebrew phrase. And the, the purpose of the Day of Atonement was, one, to rededicate the tabernacle and later the temple, uh, to reconsecrate everything and to make sure that it was all clean and all dedicated to God, and also to deal with any sins in the, in, among the nation and among the people that hadn't been dealt with by other offerings. And so this was kind of the, the catch-all offering for sins that were unknown. And so there were there was a there were kind of two parts two major features to this this offering uh, or this this festival or the Day of Atonement offerings uh, they had two they had to set apart two animals two goats and they had two different purposes first you had the the goat the, or the animal that was for the blood offering and this is the offering if, if you remember the other day I mentioned that that veil that separates the holy from the holy place from the most holy place. Uh, and there's only one day a year that the high priest crawls in underneath that and, and sprinkles blood on the mercy seat. This is that. This is the one day a year that somebody actually enters into the most holy place and sprinkles blood as an offering on the, the atonement cover. And it's to cover over and to make atonement for all of the sins of the people that might have been missed in the rest of the year. And at, on the way out, after sprinkling blood on the holy, holy place or on the mercy seat, the, priest, the high priest would then sprinkle blood on all of the various elements inside the, inside the temple or the tabernacle, like the, the table of the presence, the altar of incense, the big altar, the, the sea, or, or the basin for washing, and then would come out, and then there would be a second goat. And the second goat, the, the high priest would lay hands on the second goat, called the scapegoat, and would confess the sins of the people over that goat. And it was symbolically laying the sins of the people on that goat. And then somebody else would take that goat and lead them out of the city, away from the camp, and drive it off into the wilderness, and it would never be allowed back in the camp again. And that was symbolically this goat taking the sins of the people and carrying them far away. And so this, this, this whole sacrifice, this whole thing, is to symbolize the covering or the, the forgiving of the sin and the taking of the sin away from the people. And this is very significant in the New Testament and for, for believers because this is very heavily or seen as being very heavily symbolic of what Jesus would do. That he, he sacrifices himself, gives himself, his blood is shed to forgive the sins of God's people, not only of Israel, but of all people that would trust in God. And then the scapegoat is, Jesus is the scapegoat because on him is laid the sins of all the people and he is taken outside the city before he is crucified. He's crucified on a hill outside of the gates. Uh, and so Jesus fulfills these things and it's that fulfillment that, mean, that makes it so that we don't have to obey all of the laws in Leviticus. Only the moral ones. Yes, ma'am. Probably because the heat has been messed up and not working all day, and that's why it's really cold in here, and so it's probably making some noise because they're getting it fixed finally. Uh, we're out of time. If you have any questions, I mean, this is, I, I think Leviticus is very interesting. Some people don't. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm here. Come, come talk to me.